Thank you very much. Um, my name is Lucas. I'm part of the Healthcare Forum Organizing Committee that put this um, conference together, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the 2017 Rhodes Healthcare Forum. Um, thank you very much, in particular, to all of our amazing speakers who came from all over the world um, to join us here. I'd also like to thank the committee that's been working incredibly hard over the past year um, alongside their graduate degrees to organize the whole conference. And in particular, I would like to thank the um, members of the Atlantic Institute, which includes the Atlantic Fellows and the program leaders who are joining us for the very first time at an official Rhodes event, event this weekend. And we didn't just get them to come here, we also got a number of them to speak at the conference. Um, so please look out for their sessions. There's a lot you can learn from them. I would also like to thank um, Roy Van Sciences, um, a company that generously sponsored um, a big part of the healthcare forum and without which we couldn't do this conference. And last, last but not least, I would like to thank um, the amazing team at Rhodes House um, that's been working incredibly hard and has been really supportive over the past year to put this whole thing together. Now, this Rhodes Healthcare Forum is really special for us because it's the biggest one we've done yet um, with 150 people attending. But even more important than the numbers is what we're going to talk about. Our theme this year is Forward Together, Approaching Global Inequities in Health, which is an issue that's really close to most of our hearts. And we've got a number of amazing sessions um, scheduled throughout this weekend to inspire you and um, in your daily work on this topic or um, in work you might pick up in the future. And um, I would also like to highlight that our goal is to not only have conversations throughout this weekend, um, but to also continue the conversation after the conference. And I'd like to quickly highlight um, three different student initiatives here which are part of this effort. So the first one is our Rhodes Healthcare Forum committee and the team um, that doesn't just put on the conference, but also puts on talks throughout the term. So if you've got anyone that you think should come and should talk or should host a workshop, please reach out to us and um, bring up their names and we'll try and get them to Rhodes House. The, um, the second initiative I'd like to highlight is, um, is called the Rhodes Incubator, which is an initiative that is trying to tackle some of the issues we're talking, on, uh, talking about here. And um, they try to either found social or for-profit ventures that then work on these problems. And um, if you want to work with them and if you've got an idea that should be worked on, um, please reach out to um, Jonas, who's sitting here, or Bogdan or Tinashe, all of which are on the, um, on the team, as well as Jessica Price. And um, last but not least, I would like to highlight an initiative called the Rhodes Artificial Intelligence Lab, um, or short RAIL, which is an analytics and data science lab that works on machine learning challenges. So if you've got a healthcare problem and you would like some additional analysts who can help you with that, um, please get in touch with them. And uh, the representative here is Brody. I think he's not here yet. So in the meantime, um, I, would ask, uh, I would like to ask you to also reach out to Bogdan for that if you've got any projects for which you need additional analytics capacity. Um, now, before I hand over to our um, co-convener, Sir John Bell, there's a couple of housekeeping items, items I'd still like to highlight. Um, if you need refreshments throughout the conference, we've got refreshments all over Rhodes House, so please help yourself to them. Um, next, on the mentorship sessions, if you're a student and you would like to see one of our amazing mentors and you haven't signed up for them yet, there's a sheet at the reception um, where you can still sign up for people. And if you're a mentor, um, thank you so much for volunteering to mentor. And we'd kindly ask you to come to the mentorship session today and tomorrow because there's a lot of students who signed up for you and they're really excited to meet you. Um, we also have a number of breakout workshops um, happening throughout the weekend. And if you're wondering which one you're going to, then I'd ask you to turn around your name tag. It's got the breakout session on the back of it. And um, finally, I'd like to mention um, our social media initiative. There's a hashtag called um, hashtag RhodesHealth17. So if you want to tweet about the conference, please do it under that hashtag. And also, um, all of the sessions in Milner Hall, which is this room right here, are being filmed. Um, and they're going to be put up on YouTube. So, you can, so feel free to tweet about these sessions. Um, if you want to quote anyone from sessions that are not happening in Milner Hall, please ask for permission beforehand. Um, now, without much further ado, I'd like to hand over to Sir John Bell, who's the, professor of Re uh, the Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford, amongst many other things, and who's been instrumental in putting this conference and previous conferences together. Thank you, John. So thanks, Lucas, and, and it's really my job uh, to welcome everyone here today. It's great to see we've got such a great turnout. And, and uh, just to be completely clear about this, I don't take any credit for this meeting at all. It's all done by the committee. I do almost nothing. 
In fact, I think they even use my electronic signature on the letters. So uh, it, I, it, it is a, it, it's a, it's a pretty low level of input for me. Uh, we, we started this, uh, this is the third meeting of this kind that we've had, and every time uh, the scholars in the committee chooses a really challenging talk, topic to discuss, and this year is no exception. And I can see by the quality of the people who are attending, as well as the quality of the speakers, we're likely to have some pretty lively and interesting discussions about this over the, the next two days. Uh, I also worth welcoming the Atlantic fellows who are here today. Uh, it's great, Our, the Rhodes Trust's relationship with Atlantic Philanthropy is really now uh, embedded and it's great to have you here participating uh, in this program. So i just say a few words about the, the broad topic of health inequities, which are, I think, is a domain where we all aspire to try and deal with what we see to be a, a an inequality in a whole variety of ways in people's ability to uh, uh, get the best possible health care and share in the same remarkable outcomes that health care has delivered, particularly for the most affluent in Western societies. I was reflecting the other day that life expectancy in the UK, since I was a Rhodes Scholar, has gone up by 10 years for men and nine years for women. And if you just think about that for a minute, that is really quite a remarkable result, and that's the result of a whole set of different things, both some delivered by, by the social environment and some delivered by the healthcare system. So it would be really nice to, to, to be able to say that, that those gains in health outcomes are shared uh, across all socioeconomic groups and also uh, more globally. But Unfortunately, we can't really say that at the moment, and, and I think some of the reasons for that we can explore in the next few days. I, you know, I think it remains um, a scandal that 16,000 children globally die every day uh, under the age of five. That, you know, that can't be right. Um, it also can't be right that the differences in maternal mortality, uh, one in 16 women in Chad dies in the perinatal period, one in 17,000 dies in Sweden in the same perinatal period. That, that similarly can't be right. And the, the span in life expectancy, average life expectancy, differs by as much as 34 years across the planet. So I think one of the ambitions, and, and I think it should be the ambitions of anyone who's switched into the global uh, agenda, should be to try and deal with some of those issues of inequity. But it, it gets more complicated almost as soon as you start to think of it, because the the first thing is, what, you know, what exactly is the inequity? Is the inequity the outcome, or is the inequity the amount of money that you use to go into healthcare systems, or is the inequity the access to those healthcare systems? So defining what inequity you're trying to solve, I think, is important up front, but then also trying to understand how you measure it. Now, for some health outcomes, that's fine, but for other things, that's, I think, much more challenging. And of course, inequity can be looked at through a whole variety of different lenses. It can be looked at uh, in geographies, both internationally or even locally. Uh, so within countries, there are huge inequities, but globally, there are even bigger inequities. But also, there are inequities within and between disease areas. So some diseases get pretty well looked after in some geographies and some really badly. So there are serious inequities there uh, and inequities uh, uh, with ethnic populations, uh, inequities with different age groups. So there, you can cut the pie in a whole variety of different ways, and I think that, that adds to the confusion about what people are talking about when they actually talk about um, uh, inequities of health. Uh, and then I think the, the two arenas where this requires the most acute uh, consideration uh, are what are the real causes of those inequities, and what are the solutions? So at some level, that's easy. If kids don't get vaccinated against the major common diseases, they have a much higher chance of dying. So that's an inequity, and the solution is pretty clear at some level. But there are lots of other aspects of an inequity which are rather more difficult to manage. So just to choose one close to home, you know, the social determinants of health which were profiled so well by Michael Marmot, 
It is true that there is a major social determinant of health that you can measure in various bits of the country, and the famous um, description of moving east on the Jubilee line, losing a year of life as you go east across the uh, increasingly poor bits of South London, uh, is, is the iconic description of these social determinants of health. But, but the truth is, we don't really understand that at all. And in fact, some of the social determinants of health are, are things that we understand well, but have never really quantified properly. So, you know, what really is the impact of smoking in those populations? What really is the impact of dietary variation in those populations? Well, they actually have quite a profound effect, and in fact, account for quite a bit of that variation that you see across populations. But so do things which are relatively simple things, like access to healthcare. And indeed, Michael published a nice paper in The Lancet four or five years ago that shows that you know, most of the variation, or much of the variation that isn't uh, uh, accounted for by the covariates of smoking and diet and so on, can be accounted for by simply access to healthcare. Poor people don't access healthcare. Uh, you know, that that's, seems pretty self-evident. But if that's the problem, then how do you fix the problem? And what are the solutions to those problems? So I think, uh, although it, it sounds like it's something you can get at relatively simply. This is a multi-dimensional problem and requires quite a bit of thought. I hope one of the things we will talk a lot about though is health systems because the, the intervention that most societies have put into place to try and deal with this are health systems. Now, we could argue whether they're appropriate for the problems that are trying to be solved and in fact in many cases they're not often because they're targeted at the wrong disease groups or the wrong population groups. But, but nevertheless, I think it is, uh, it is a key issue, no matter where you are globally, about how the health system is designed to deal with the biggest inequities and how you manage them. And that's become particularly challenging in the modern world where all healthcare systems are now severely financially challenged and decisions have to be made about how best to apply the resources at hand to deal with these inequities and to try and be fair. Now, some healthcare systems don't make any pretense of trying to be fair. So the American healthcare system, for example, could care less. But, the, but, but in places where we do have single-payer healthcare systems funded by the taxpayer, fairness and equity is obviously a central premise about what we're trying to do. And it's, I think, therefore important to think quite hard about how you get healthcare systems to operate in this increasingly challenging environment. And for those of you who are operating within the NHS, you can see how difficult it is for these systems to do even relatively simple things well. I, I think it, th the biggest single issue, and this applies both to the developing and to the developed world though, is how you can change the, essentially the, the formula for healthcare systems delivering a higher level of product, in other words, much better outcomes for less money. And that ultimately will require innovation of a whole variety of different kinds. That's what's happened in almost every other arena of human activity, is that in the end, although innovation sometimes can drive costs up, and healthcare systems are very bad at adopting innovation because they often just layer it on top of what they had before. But at its best, healthcare systems should be able to drive down costs and improve outcomes. But I think it's also clear that healthcare systems are actually not a very good place to evaluate and test those innovations. So there is an interesting question about how do you get healthcare systems to be more innovative and to do things better, produce better outcomes, and cost less. And I think there are a number of models worldwide about how that's happening. Some of them, I have to say, in the developing world where they've really been forced to try and do things in a very different way to try and deliver healthcare um, much more effectively. So, I, I mean, that, that's a very high level scamper across the top, top of health and equity and, and very superficial, I suspect, compared to the kind of discussions we're gonna have in the next few days. But I think it, uh, it, I, it's really great to see so many of you attending today. I hope there will be free and frank discussions as we get through the meeting, both in the meeting and also in the breakout sessions. So, Thanks to the organizers for putting it all together. I think it's a great program, and I'm looking, very much looking forward to it. Lucas, thanks a lot. Thank you, John. So I'm also a co-convener of, uh, of this meeting, 
And as John mentioned, I think my contributions have been extremely minimal as well. I think the students have really put together an amazing uh, schedule and really look forward to the discussions over the next couple of days. So I was also asked to frame the conversations that we'll be having over the next couple of days and maybe give us a, a more personal perspective uh, with regards to thinking about uh, inequities in global health. And I think HIV has really taught us a lot um, about addressing inequities. We've made some significant strides. We still have work to do. Um, but I think HIV is an example, and that's where I have uh, focused m much of my efforts. So I remember the very first person I met with with HIV infection. I was uh, 16 years old in, in Zimbabwe, and she was probably 22, 23 years old, so slightly older than I was, and had three children with her. The third who uh, was malnourished and, and um, uh, looked like the third had HIV infection as well. And I was struck by that encounter, firstly because we were similar age and yet our life trajectories were going to be very different. And second, um, because of the anxiety and uncertainty and fear that she had, she knew she was dying and she was uncertain about the future of her children. Flash forward a few years later, I'm a medical student in, in Boston um, and uh, learning how to interview patients and request uh, to be linked with the patient living with HIV. I meet a young gay man and his partner and he um, has HIV and is on antiretroviral therapy, so this is in the mid to late, uh, late 90s, is taking a handful of pills with other pills to counteract the side effects of the HIV uh, pills and diarrhea and complications, etc. Um, and what struck me about him is, um, unlike the, the woman in Zimbabwe, um, even though the side effects were awful, he had hope. Um, he had seen many of his friends die, but he had hoped that he would uh, do well. That summer, I went back to Zimbabwe and uh, unfortunately had a personal experience where a close family member died of HIV. And I was struck by the fact that unlike my Boston patient, we couldn't afford drugs, we didn't have access to drugs, didn't even know how to get drugs, and the cost was unfathomable uh, to us. This led me to work on HIV, led me to come over here and work um, uh, on a DFIL in HIV immunology, particularly working in East Africa and so on, and years later to go back to finish medical school and spend my elective time in Zimbabwe. And this was now in the early 2000s, where 80% of patients in the hospital were HIV infected. And a colleague had set up an HIV clinic, and um, at that time, just to provide drugs for opportunistic infections, we didn't have antiretroviral therapy. And later on, to provide antiretroviral therapy and to go on to take care of thousands of patients living with HIV. But I tell this story really to highlight that in just um, from the mid-90s when I met my first uh, encounter with HIV through till about 2005, a patient in Zimbabwe could go from having no hope to having access to antiretroviral therapy. Initially complicated regimens, but with time, uh, single tablet regimens that could be taken once daily. So in HIV, we have been able to advance the science, advance the technology, and increase access. Although still about 50% or so of people who need antiretroviral therapy don't have access to it, it's pretty remarkable that 50% do. It's pretty remarkable that we have shifted the paradigm. Many thought it was not possible to provide therapy in sub-Saharan Africa. And yet today, patients in sub-Saharan Africa have much better outcomes than many patients in resource-rich settings providing an opportunity to think about how do you deliver health on a public, um, public scale and still attempt to have good outcomes, whether it's in terms of access, virologic suppression, um, et cetera. So I hope as we discuss global inequities, we think about all the, the issues from uh, research and development all the way through to a provision of, of healthcare, um, healthcare uh, systems, and think of it in a bi-directional way, because I think there's a lot that we can learn from resource-limited settings that might have fewer barriers to implementing new technologies, new therapies, 
than more um, established settings. And then lastly, I'd just like to um, point out that although we've made strides in HIV, there's a whole lot of other diseases that we still have real challenges with. I always recall uh, rounding on patients in, in Paranyatwa Hospital in Zimbabwe, and in one bed you'll have a patient with HIV and TB, and they can access TB drugs, HIV drugs, they might be able to get lab tests, they might be able to get social support. Next to them is their mother who has diabetes and hypertension. Next to them is their sister who has cervical cancer. And those folks don't have access to the same resources that are available for patients living with HIV. So it's really important that as we address one inequity, we don't forget that these um, diseases don't occur in isolation. They occur as part of a complex network of clinical conditions as well as social, um, uh, social issues, and that we have a holistic approach to bridging um, health inequities, not just by disease area, but really across, uh, across the board. So I'm very excited uh, for the next couple of days and really hope that we will have a very engaging discussion across the board from you know, HIV, mental health, surgical issues, and, and really look forward to spending the next couple of days with you. Thank you.